going on everyone? It's Hippie with the Hookup Tackle and I'm back here to shoot another video for you guys. We're gonna talk about one of the toughest techniques that you know I feel like people try to kind of stay away from and that's how to find, locate, and target deep water structure bass. Let's dive into it. Welcome to the Hookup Tackle. The Hookup Tackle is the world's largest showcase of Mega Bass products featuring baits and colors not found at any other dealer. The hookup also offers a wide display of OSP, Evergreen, Depths, Lucky Craft, Jackal, and many more. The hookup tackle is owned and operated by family, is staffed by guides and verified tackle nerds who love helping anglers elevate their craft. If you're in the Phoenix area, we'd love to have you stop by our showroom and check out the wonderful world of Mega Bass and the hookup for yourself. If you shop online, there are almost 10,000 SKUs of Mega Bass products alone with hundreds of other companies and new products being added daily. So next time you're looking for that hard to find bait, that color your fish have never seen before, or maybe you just wanna elevate your game, look at thehookuptackle.com. All right guys, so I kinda wanna break down, you know, what's the starting point? You know, you, you get in the boat, you know, you're idling out, it's cold. Uh, what, what are you looking for? So, you know, you got your map, you're looking at your map. Electronics plays a big, big part in this technique. The main things I'm looking for are two different types of structure. So deep rock and deep trees, whether they're off a long tapering point or they're on an isolated, you know, island or high spot or a channel swing. And that's whether it's early in, you know, the winter months. So if we're talking like January or we're talking, you know, some places it's still cold in like April. So there are certain times where you're going to be looking for certain deep water structure in certain places. So like if the fish are pre-spawn, but they're still deep, I'm going to look for a channel that's got deep trees in it. Or if, uh, you know, fish are schooling on shad and it's like, you know, January, but they're, they're doing it down deep. You know, I'm going to look for a long, long tapering point that's got chunk rock down there and they're just wadded up. You can catch them, you know, vertically spooning or a drop shot or something like that. So there's different styles of deep water fishing in the winter months. So that's kind of the tip of the iceberg. If you guys want to see a more in-depth video of how we break things down, you know, electronics, you know, the, the whole nine yards when it comes to deep water structure, leave a comment down below and we might do that for you guys. But today we're going to talk about, you know, once I've got these fish located, how do we target them? What are some of the main techniques? Keep it simple, but there's some staples that you need to target these fish once you have them located. So this time of year, the main bait that I reach for is a drop shot rig. So a drop shot, there's so many different variations of it, whether the fish are on craws or they're on shad. I'm gonna go over some different baits and you know different hooks and weights and leader lengths that I choose to maximize my bites. I get out there and I get on a long point and it's got rock on it. So the majority of the time, if they're on rock off the edge, you could have both craws and shad. So out here, mainly if you're on the uh, edge of a rock point, you know, it's mainly gonna be shad. So if I've got one or two individual fish off the edge of this point, then, you know, I'm gonna grab a drop shot rig with like a curly tail, shad colored worm or a morning dawn or something like that that's gonna imitate a shad. And I'm gonna drop straight down on them, you know, vertical fishing for them and see if I can get them to go if I've got one or two. Once I kind of discover that, if I catch one and then all of a sudden I look back down and my graph just lit up, then I can reach for, you know, other options, something like a, you know, a jigging spoon, something like this crippled herring, or you could even throw a blade bait down there. And that's when you look at your screen and it's all spaghettied up, you know, and the fish are active down there and they're chasing shad down deep. You know, it's almost a reaction bite in deep water. So that's two, the two prong approach that I kind of look for when I'm looking at rock. Now there's times where fish are on crawdads. You know, some people don't believe that crawdads live, you know, 40, 50, 60 feet, but they do. You know, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've caught one, you know, in 60 foot of water and it comes up and, you know, spitting crawdads everywhere. If they're on crawdads, I like to shorten my leader to like a four or a six inch leader. And then I'm going to go to some sort of people's worm or, you know, a blue crawler, something that's that's looking like a crawdad. And then also I've been playing around with some realistic looking options. You know, you could do like a doe live craw, like a three inch or, you know, this, this little jack shrimp. So that, that would be a good one. Why would you use a straight tail worm over a craw if they're eating craws? So, I mean, the, the that's bait? just like the main profile. Like I grew up throwing, you know, worm, like that's my confidence bait. Mm -hmm. But if I know they're eating craws and I'm going to elaborate a little bit, you know, cause everybody's got a worm in their boat. 
So why wouldn't I try to, you know, put a, a small craw or, you know, something a little bit more realistic if they're keyed in on that so well, you know, gotcha. so, I reach for something, something different. So after a while of catching them on a, like a brown or worm, you would switch their craw because people are... A hundred percent. You got to have options. You know, if you drop down and you catch three fish on a brown worm, you know, you might not have a bite for an hour afterward. But if you were to drop, you know, just mix up your profile, you know, that could be a bite or two that you didn't think you were going to get. So, like, if I've got fish suspended, like, if I roll up over 60 feet and I see them, like, a lot of people don't think they're bass, but I'll see them in, like, 40 feet. Or, sorry, if they're in 40 feet, and, like, I'll see them in, like, 25. So, like, a little trick I do is I go to, like, a 316 ounce weight to see if they're bass, and I'll, and I'll pitch down there, you know, and watch them follow it down. And most of the time, like, if you've got a 3 8 ounce weight or something a little heavier, like, and you pitch it down there, or you drop down on them, it goes down past them so fast that they don't even care for it. And sometimes these bass come up over the structure and suspend, you know, so a light weight for suspended fish that you'll see. A right. To find out if they're bass, because a lot of times, you know, there's so many different species over these structure spots you don't know sometimes. So I'll go to that lighter weight. You know, if they follow it down, I'm like, OK, they're bass. Yeah. And then once they're, I get them to follow it down, then I can go pick up my quarter ounce rod. Most of the time I've got, you know, a 3 16th quarter and a 3 8 ounce drop shot rigged up mm -hmm. with different leaders, you know, gotcha. when I'm doing this. When you're doing that. Yeah. So leader length and weight, Matt, you'll have three drop shot rods pretty much on right. your deck. Right, sometimes even five, just depending on how crazy I'm getting. Gotcha. So but it's it's a pretty important thing to think about, like leader length and then... Absolutely. Okay. Like if you drop down and you've got an 18-inch leader and a morning dawn worm, right, and you drop down there and you catch one and the fish comes up and pukes out a crawdad... Like, I'm going to reach right down there. Like, he ate it, right? But there's something else that they're going to eat better that's going to look more realistic. Mm. So I'm going to grab my one rod with a, you know, a 3 8 ounce weight and a, a four-inch leader and a craw and a nose hook, Instead. and I'm going to feed them that. Gotcha. And they're probably going to eat that a little bit Instead. better. Okay. You know? Makes sense. Yeah, Just the matching the hatch, you know? Yeah. Now, is your leader length switching on a shad style? Yes. Yeah, so if I'm throwing a shad style bait, it's always going to be, you know, 18 to 20 inches. Like, you know, probably a foot is the shortest I'll go on a shad bait. Mm. You know, a shad's never run in the bottom. You know, if I'm in 50 feet, like, and if I ever, ever see a school of bait down there, it's usually like, you know, 15 feet off of the bottom or something like that. So I like that longer leader. So it, it looks realistic. Gotcha. You know, now would you also do the weight? differences with the shad style one that's lighter and one that's heavier for depends it? you know like mainly a quarter ounce is where i stick if i'm drop shotting a shad, shad bait or a okay. shad colored worm but then again if their fish are suspended and i can see the bait ball up there and that's why they're suspended or they're waiting for bait or something like that then i'll go to that 316s and then once i find out their bass and they follow it down then i grab my quarter to get down there to them gotcha you so know that it's just reaching them that's the whole thing the whole thing so yeah. the biggest difference between like a shad style and a worm or craw is the leader length overall overall it's the leader length yeah it's just to make it look more natural you know, more natural 100 percent. Okay. plus you never want to fish over fish you know mm. so many fucking guys drop down and like you know three eight ounce weight because that's the only thing they can feel yeah. you know and they're like oh look at all the gizzard chad swimming around yeah it's like oh those are bass yeah <laughs> And they miss out on those Yeah, fish. exactly. The drop shot's kind of like what you always like. You can start with it, and it's a phenomenal bait. And then there's times where, you know, everybody's throwing it, and you would think something so light like that, it kind of gets pressured, right? Yeah. So I try to, you know, back off. Like, so if I find them, you know, schooled up, and I caught some on a jigging spoon, or I caught some on a, a shad drop shot, I'll back off, you know, whether it's 40, 50, 60 feet, and I'll throw an Alabama rig to them, dude. You Even know, down in like 40, 50. Yes, 100%. You mm. know, sink it down to them and just slow roll it. You know, if they're on shad and this thing comes by them, you know, they're, they're going they're right. to crush it. Gotcha. Plus, not a lot of people have the patience to sink, you know, an Alabama rig right, that deep. Yeah. So if they're on shad, it definitely fires them up. In a rig. You know, okay. yeah, they almost act like summertime fish, like when you feed them the right stuff. Mm -hmm. They uh, get fired up. Yeah, they get fired up. And you can also do that with a blade bait. You know, you can, you can cast the blade bait out past them you know work it through them yeah you know back off the fish once you locate them you know on the vertical they're gonna stop eating vertical at some point yeah you know they're not you're not gonna sit there and catch a hundred bass you're gonna catch two or three out of the school and they're gonna shut off and then you're gonna need to back off you know and cast something to them 
Now, are you fishing that A rig on the bottom or are you fishing it suspended? Like, you know, f depending on where the fish are. Again, so if they're down on the bottom and I still think that they're shad eaters, then, you know, let it get down to the bottom and I'll try to keep it like 10 feet off the bottom. You know, okay. slow roll and then kind of sink it back down to them. Um, you know, just keep it down there as long as possible. Gotcha. But then there's times where they're up in the water column, you know, and I can see them on pan optics or something and mm -hmm. I'll cast that over to them. And, and kind of just sink it out, count it down. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if, let's just say those fish on the bottom that you were graphing, they were crawdad eaters, would you still throw the blade bait or would you fish to like a jig instead? No, so if those are crawdad eaters, you know, and they're done eating the drop shot, then I like a big profile jig. So I don't throw a jig a lot, but when I do, like in the winter time, like most of the time, like, you know, if I throw a jig, I like like the depth headlock, like the small one or like a three inch craw on the back. Yeah. But in the winter time, it's a time to help me slow down I like like a, a full size jig, you know, so the hyper football has got a lot more skirt on it, bigger hook. And then I'll do like a four inch craw, you know, this rains craw or a big chigger craw or something like that, you know, that's gonna help slow me down. That skirt and that big plastic, that bulky plastics, you know, I'm gonna be able to drag it a lot slower. Gotcha, so, so. you, so a jig, when you back off from the drop shot fish is what you would do. Yeah, if they're okay. on crawdads, you know, I wanna have a couple different options, you yeah, know? Okay. So a jig is a great wintertime staple. Now, I've been hearing from you and Ben lately, this dick rig? <laughs> the dick rig. So, is there an explanation to this? Dick rig. <laughs> so, what uh, is this rig? <laughs> okay, so most of you know it as the Nico rig, but that's lame. So, we call it the dick rig. It's been around forever, so... Basically, it's the Nico rig. You know, you put a plastic sleeve over your worm, some sort of Cinco style hook or Nico rig hook there is now, and then you put a weight in the head of it. I like a heavy one. So, you know, most guys use a light one. We use a heavy dick rig. <laughs> so like a 532nd or maybe even a quarter ounce, something heavy, stick it in the nose of that worm. And what's awesome about this is if the fish are on trees, like that, you could see them suspended in the like, treetops right they're not down in the roots of the trees so like you know i don't need to drop a drop shot all the way down in there i can back off and see them mm -hmm. you know on pan or whether i saw them vertically you know i back off and i'll cast that dick rig out there you know and it falls slow down to them mm -hmm. so most of the time a drop shot will go right down into the tree and they're like i'm not gonna fall that down in there you know I, so that dick rig's falling nice and slow like all right yeah i might bite that you know for those suspended yeah. fish like if it's a warm day they'll come up you know they're not going to push up shallow mm -hmm. but they're going to come up from deep water because that tree is like 30 feet deep some of these big orchard trees trees and stuff yeah they're big uh, yeah so they'll come up to the top dude and and that that slower fall rate they mm -hmm. like that now a lot of guys associate the nico rig for a shallow water right uh presentation yeah now how long are you waiting for a Nico rig to throw it out in 50, 60 foot of water? So most of the time, this is only when they're suspended. So my baits really, so even if I'm in 60 and this tree comes up to 30, like I'm only like 25, mm. you know? So plus with that heavier weight, you know, I can get down there, it's not crazy, but yeah, it's definitely manageable. So are you expecting to get bit on the fall? So you're not really working it then? You're no, it's all on the fall. Yeah, so like once it gets down to where I can, you know where i kind of want it to be and i feel like i'm okay i'm starting to bump down into those tree limbs like i can kind of work it through them a little bit and then i reel it in like most of the time dude is like okay i i see them suspended i back off fire that dicker got there you know on the fall okay got him hmm. so it's kind of like a, a wacky rig cinco right but just in deeper water and mm -hmm. nico gotcha exactly they still eat some of these same things these yeah. are still bass that you caught you know in the springtime in the, the springtime they shallow, just right? live in deeper gotcha. you know <laughs> wow a special guest appearance before hippie continues with his next product he is going to show you let's take a moment to pause to appreciate the greatest beer on earth in hopes that orion is looking i'm still looking for a sponsorship for these videos, this is Delicious Orion. Now, it is morning here, and no time is a bad time for a Delicious Orion. Wouldn't you agree, Hippie? Absolutely. It's eight o'clock in the morning. I don't, <sighs> I don't think that... Delicious. Okay. If you guys haven't tried this yet, this is the beer of champions. So, Orion, hit me up. I wanted <laughs> to make sure that before you guys are super confused why the hippie is calling it the dick rig. So the reason for that is we've actually been throwing the 
Nico rig or a Neko rig for like decades. So originally out here on the West Coast, there is a guy named Hideki who came here. Now Hideki is the owner of Tekel Lures. And we used to all just kind of call him Hideki. And then it just kind of became Dicky and so on and so forth. So he brought this crazy rig, the Neko rig, uh, over with him. And we just started nicknaming it the Dick Rig. So that is what it is in reference to. It is Hideki, not uh, what Jeff was originally thinking. Such a dirty mind, yeah, Jeff. I'm sorry. Now back to the program. Okay. Sorry that you guys aren't learning for the from the master oh, expert of structure fishing. But, you know, hippie's okay. You catch some fish. Get out of my seat, dude. Get up. Get up. Let's talk about let's talk about no, some I mean, what, things I mean, that matter. Dude. Why don't we throw down a challenge here? Okay. What, what here. are you implying? You, this is the Orion segment, so okay. you at least have All to right. hold it. Oh. Don't, don't drink it. That's mine. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> but you the gotta keep thing. it. You gotta keep it in the frame. Okay. Right. All right. All right. Oh, do you want to do a throwdown? Let's do it. You're a shallow water guy. Yeah. I'm a deep water guy. Yeah. We here's the rules. Okay. Okay. Uh, you gotta take me to your spots, and I gotta, <laughs> I gotta be able to look at your graphs okay. because I don't know how to do any of that fancy shit. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's grab us a twelve pack of these and hit the water, and let's see what happens. I get eleven. <laughs> Play them. <laughs> what? Wouldn't even give me a beer. So this is kind of a new one that I've kind of been playing around with the last couple of years. When the fish are on shad, whether they're on rock or around some wood, I like a three-inch doe live stick, and a ball head, so like a Kitek tungsten ball head. And what I do with this, you know, light line, spinning rod, five, six pound test. If I see him down there eating shad, I back off and set it. You can drop it vertically, but I kind of back off, pitch it out in front where those fish were and just slack line it all the way down. It's gonna spiral down. Very rarely do I get bit on the way down. Once it's down there, I basically do what's like called like tight lining kind of. So I just kind of get it tight, get it like five feet off the bottom and just hold it. Like you don't really do a lot with it. You just kind of hold it tight and just barely move. So this thing's kind of like, kind of doing like a little cowboy, hmm. you know, just very subtle. But dude, it gets gets some extra bites. Like whether they're done eating the jigging spoon or you know the drop shot. So that's shot. that's vertical fishing. Vertical, but like I don't drop it straight down. I kind of back off and kind of pitch it out there because mm -hmm. it spirals. It doesn't really look good when it when it's falling. But once it's down there, it just looks like a natural shad and that doe life stick is so soft that barely any action or even just holding it, dude, that tail's still quivering. So you're not really working it that hard? No, not at all. Okay. You know, it's just kind of holding it tight and then you can add a little bit of shake. So that's something new that you've been Yeah, the last couple of years I've been, I've been playing with it and it's definitely got me some, some bites. All right, so let's talk about hook choice when you're drop shotting. So if I'm vertically in a deep tree, I'm always gonna go with some sort of rebarb or cover shot style hook, right? So my bait is weedless and I can drop it down into that tree and not worry about getting hung up all the time. Another thing, like if, you know, I'm in open water and they're on rock, you know, or I'm throwing those crawdad baits, they're not gonna set up that well on a rebarb style hook. You know, they're gonna wanna bend and they just don't look natural. So I go to something in these lines, you know, either a mosquito or a shot rig, some sort of nose hook. I just feel like my hookup ratio is better when I'm fishing those style baits. That's just kind of a brief explanation of, you know, my style of deep water fishing or how I approach it, but it's definitely for the guys in boats. Now, I know there's a lot of you that fish from the bank, shore anglers. No, this can definitely apply for you too. So like if you see a tree out there or you know there's a ditch, like most ponds or small lakes have some sort of ditch or, or you know, groove or something in the middle of that pond that's gonna conjugate those fish. So definitely think about that. Or, you know, some ponds have bubblers, like the fish migrate towards a bubbler. It's got oxygen and there's, it's a deep, deep area, usually in the middle of the pond, or if there's a deep concrete wall, you just, this can definitely apply to you. You just kinda use your eyes, you know, and okay, what's the deepest part in this pond or what's some sort of structure that, you know, I've never really fished. You wanna kinda incorporate that. And I think this would work for you shore anglers as well. So obviously from shore you can't vertical jig stuff. Right. So what would you be fishing at, you know, some of the, like these urban spots that we have here? Right. So, I mean, forage is definitely going to play into it. But, dude, I mean, a drop shot with like a six inch leader, whether it's a shad worm or crawdad looking worm, I think that's a good way to slow down, you know, just light line. 
and a drop shot, you know, target the deepest points in your pond or small lake, and it's definitely going to get you some bites. Now, you said try to find the deepest part of the lake. Right. How would you find that out yourself without, you know, having a graph or anything like that? So, I mean, it's kind of like self-explanatory, right? You're just going to you're going to walk up to a pond and okay, the middle, right? So you would I, so I used to do this as a kid. I would always tie on like a heavy, heavy bait. Mm-hmm. Like when I would go and, you know, in the wintertime where you don't belong out in a pond, <laughs> I was always out there, you know, trying to catch a bass. And I would put on a heavy bait and throw into the center of the pond and try to feel like, obviously I would lose some baits doing this, but I would try to feel if there was any sort of like change in contour or change like, okay, this just sunk, you know, a little bit deeper than that, you know, and I would focus on an area because even though a bass is in a pond, it's still a bass. You know, so this time of year, they're going to migrate towards the deepest part. And still suspend. Exactly. Still so suspend. They're still going to act the same. Whether they're eating bluegills, crawdad, shad, they're bass is a bass. All right. So the way to do it is really just grab like, you know, a jig or your drop shot and just kind of drag it around and see where is the deepest spot. If there's a ledge, if there's exactly. a rock. Okay. Yeah. Use the tools that you have to your advantage and just, you know, rather than casting towards the bank, you know, try to have a different thought process of what's actually down there all right guys hopefully this helps thanks again for joining me today and yeah if you guys want to see that video leave a comment down below and we'll get it out for you guys stay tuned for me whipping hippies ass on the water (laughs) get this guy out of here bye guys